Hello everybody and welcome to this, our third problem in module 13-1. This is another single factor ANOVA, this time it's an observational study. The first two exercises that we've done were experimental studies. The only difference between an experimental study and the observational study is how the data has been collected. In the experimental studies, the researcher has some control over the application of treatments to their experimental units. An observational study, we can think of the data as already existing. The data is out there in the world around us, and I'm going to collect some data from here, from here, from here, and I'm going to perform a test to see if I have evidence to show that one of those, at least one of those, are different. Aside from that, the methodology employed in actually doing the test is identical. So I'm going to go through this exercise. I'll probably go through this maybe a little bit faster because it's the third one that we've looked at and the calculations are all pretty much the same. So we'll go through and maybe I'll talk about a couple of things here and there as we, as we get through it. Okay, so here I am cheating. I am copying this from problem 10-2D, which was really a two population variation on this test. And that problem, we are looking at just two of these majors. Now we're looking at three of these majors. And certainly with this tool set, with the ANOVA type of a test, we can look at four, five, six, 10, 20 different majors. All that does is make our calculations more time consuming. It doesn't change anything. It only changes the length of calculations, the number of calculations we have to do. So again, I am keeping to three treatments, to three samples only because it's the fewest number of samples that require this ANOVA methodology. We could do two samples with this, but it's easier to do a Z test or a T test. We could do four, five, 10 of these samples, but it just becomes more cumbersome. Okay, so here we are. We're looking at uh, the TRU School of Business and Economics did a survey of, of alumni salaries over the last five years. In problem 10.2D, we only had the salaries of students in finance and economics. This time, we have data for the marketing major. Test for any difference between the three, not two, the three, using a 10% level of significance. So, step one, as always, state the null and alternative. I have the mean of the economics is equal to the mean of finance is equal to the mean of marketing. The alternative, not all, are equal. Or certainly I could say at least one of them is different than the others. So like all of the other exercises that we have done, we are going to be assuming we're going to do all of our calculations under the assumption that the null is true, which means all of those population means that are all equal to some common population mean, which means I need a point estimate of that common population mean. And that point estimate is, as always, x double bar. Now, first first formula to go to for x double bar is going to be that weighted average. And if, and only if our sample sizes are equal, well, then I can calculate the mean of the means. But here I can see my sample sizes are not all equal. So I do have to calculate it using this weighted average formula. So this is going to be 54 times that average, 96, two, not one, 96,213. The next one, 63, 94,315. And the next one, 61 times 92,416. 
divide those by the total number of observations, 54 plus 63 plus 61. And what is this going to give us? 54 times 96 to 13 plus 63 times 94, 315 plus 61 times 92, 416 divided by 54, 63, 61. This gives me an average, a weighted average of $94,240. So that's my point estimate of the common population mean that would exist in a world where the null hypothesis is true. And all of the means are the same. They all come from the same distribution. And my best point estimate of that distribution mean is $94,240. Next step. Now we're going to produce our ANOVA table. I'm just going to write this grand mean up here just to clear away some space so that I don't have to scroll up and down quite so much when I'm going through these calculations for the ANOVA. So here's our table. I'm going to have sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean squared, F, P, and F critical, and we're doing this actually, it's given us a 10% level of significance. And here we'll have our sources. First is always treatment, error, and total. Okay, so we have all of our ingredients. We're ready to get into our calculations. SSTR, I'm gonna move this over because I'm probably gonna need all the room that I can get. SSTR, so this formula, again, just as a reminder, those differences between sample means and the grand mean squared multiplied by each of their respective sample sizes. So our first one, sample size is 54, the mean is 96 to 13. Fifty-four, that mean is 96 to 13, and my grand mean was 94 to 40. The next one, I had a sample mean here, 63, 94,315. fifteen minus that grand mean squared. Plus the last one, 61, and that means 92,416. minus the grand mean squared. Okay, now again, I like to just kind of do this in parts. Helps avoid unnecessary mistakes. So I'll start off with the first 96 to 13 minus 94 to 40 squared times 54. This gives me 210200, oh, that's, there's no decimal in here, okay, 210207, 366, plus 94315, minus 94240, squared, times 63, that gives me 354375, and the next one, 92,416 minus 94,240 squared times 61. And here I have 20294553. Five, 
Whew, okay. Now we've got all of our parts. Now I'm just gonna add these together to get our SSTR. So plus 35375 plus 21020736. And there's our SSTR. I should have made my ANOVA bigger. 41350727. Okay, we have our SSTR, 413507277, degrees of freedom here, K minus 1, K is still the number of treatments, we have 3, so 2 degrees of freedom. Divide sum of squares by degrees of freedom, gives me my mean square. 20675 3 I need to move this over 753638.5 Okay move on to the next one SSE SSE here we're looking at that weighted value of that sample variance. So sample size minus one times the variance. So here I have the first one that was 54 minus one. And I have standard deviation. So I do have to make sure that I square it is 6340. So this is gonna be 6340 plus the next one, 63 minus one, times 6,001. Make sure I square that. And the next one, that sample size was 61, times that sa standard deviation, 62.35. Okay, so I have 53 times 6340 squared plus 62 times 6001 squared plus 60 times 6235 squared equals, see if I can fit this all in here, 66956245. Two is our SSE. Degrees of freedom, NT minus K. NT is that total number of observations. So here I have 54 plus 63 plus 61. NT is equal to 178. We have three different treatments, three different samples. So our degrees of freedom here is 175. Sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom, 66956, six, we have to enter in this giant SSE, divided by its degrees of freedom. And here I have 3826071. Sixty-four. Okay, that's the hard part. Now we can calculate our F statistic. And here that F is MSTR, always in the numerator, divided by MSE in the denominator. So this is going to be 20, 67, 5, 3, 6, 3, 8, 0.5 divided by MSE and that's going to give me, let's get this in, 6753688 I think I missed a number, 20675363.5 divided by 382607 
that gives me a test statistic, 5.4. Phew, okay. Now, we need our p-value. We need our critical value. Our f distribution is one that has two numerator degrees of freedom and 175 denominator degrees of freedom. We're doing this at the 10% level of significance. So let's go down to our F tables, way down here. Two and 175. There's two, well, the closest I have to 175 is 100. But when we have those larger degrees of freedom, those larger sample sizes, the differences are pretty small. If we look here, just for sake of comparison, that F statistic with 100 degrees of freedom at 0.1 is 2.356, so that would be our critical value for this test. Increasing to 1,000 degrees of freedom, that value doesn't change very much. So yes, we're approximating 175 degrees of freedom to 100, but we can see here it makes a very, very minute difference. So our critical value is 2.356. So there we go, 2.356. Our test statistic is 5.4. So there's 2.356 that defines our reject and our do not reject. Our test statistic is way out here, 5.4. Certainly if this area is equal to 0.1, well then this area must be less than Point one. And if we go into our tables, we can maybe get some idea of just how much less it is. Looking at those four numbers, our test statistic is larger than the largest. So here I have a value of 4.8 corresponds to a probability of 0 0.01. So 4.8 That gives me an upper tail probability of 0 0.01. Our test statistic is even bigger, which means that that probability, oops, is actually less than 0 0.01. So we have a large test statistic relative to the critical value. We have a tiny p-value which means at that level of significance, well, at any reasonable level of significance, really, even if it was 5%, even if it was 1% level of significance, we have very strong evidence here to reject. We have evidence to reject the null hypotheses. We have evidence to show that at least one of those majors, if not all of them, is earning a different average salary than the others. And this is an average salary uh, over the last five years. So, what's next? Perform a Fisher's LSD if necessary. Well, we rejected the null hypotheses, which means Fisher's LSD is necessary. So I will produce a second video. We will pick up right here and we will perform those Fisher's LSD also at the 10% level of significance. Okay, so don't go far. We'll be right back. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye.